Someone once said of that iconic American poem, Casey at the Bat. Might not be great poetry, but it's a good poem. I'd have to ask, if, if Casey at the Bat isn't great poetry, then what is? John Keats's Ode to Dejection? Petrarchian Sonnets of Melancholy? Longfellow's Hiawatha? Have you ever read that? I'll stick with Casey at the Bat every single time. The outcome wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but an inning left to play. So when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. Great poetry distills and, and focuses our perception of the human condition. Great poetry uses language to, to delight and to move us. Poetry uses the sound and the, the, the rhythm and the meaning of words in a way that illuminates and, and celebrates what it means to be human. Casey at the bat does all of that. And then some. Not great poetry. Denigrated by some as, uh, as trite or banal or or even hokey? If Casey at the bat is hokey, then life is hokey. If Casey is trite, then falling in love is trite, and, and having your heart broken is banal. Bart Giamatti, the, the late, great, great commissioner of baseball, once said of this boys game that grown men play, he said, it breaks your heart. It's, it's designed to break your heart. Baseball does just that again and again, and, and yet we keep coming back for more. What is it uh, about us that we, we so enjoy this game and, and movies and books and poems that make manifest the breaking of hearts? Maybe it's, it's hope. That, that human imperative that, that Ernest Lawrence Thayer did, described in, in Casey at the Bat, it's, it's that hope that springs eternal in the human breast. Who among us, having read that poem for the first time 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 years ago, doesn't read it again the same way that I do? Still hoping, still wishing, still believing even that, that this time, Finally, at long last, old Casey will, will keep his eye on the ball. His swing will be level and, and he'll connect with the fat part of his bat and bring joy long overdue to the fans of Mudville. Mudville is where we live. It's who we are, citizens all of Mudville. From dirt and dust where we first fashioned it, and it's to dirt and dust we're going to return. The years between our arrival and this veil of tears and the, the making of our final out are, are seasoned with hope, joy, crushing defeats, thrills, and, and yeah, with some, some broken hearts. And, and who would have it any other way? There may be no poem in the English language that has instigated, provoked, demanded even, more poetic responses to the original than Ernest Lawrence Thayer's Casey at the Bat. There have been parodies, sequels, prequels, what ifs, and any number of alternate outcomes. Well, I've got a poem that, that isn't one of those. And it comes after Casey, but it's not about Casey. It's, it's about another man, another ball player, and it's about us. This poem takes place again in, in Mudville. Well, it doesn't take place in Mudville. It's hard to hide on a, on a baseball dime. Character is revealed. So, was Mighty Casey a, a tr tragic figure? Or was he a buffoon? Were we observing an, an act of hubris or one of stoic resolve? And, and were we seeing in that poem the stuff of, of great tragedy? Does hope spring eternal in the human breast? Or are our lives lived in that quiet desperation that, 
Henry David Thoreau described one time as being the common condition of the great mass of men. Or as Thayer put it in, in Casey at the back. Somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. Somewhere, the band is playing, and somewhere, hearts are light. Somewhere, men are laughing, and somewhere, children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck it. What I have for you isn't a, a parody or a, or a sequel to Casey at the Bat, but, but rather it's the narrative of another man's chance at the plate. We're going to stand in the place that Ernest Lawrence Thayer created a hundred and some years ago, and we're going to look in another direction. We're going to look for another hero. We're going to look at, at what it means to be achingly human. To be a man a, a hundred and some years ago and to be a person today. Like Thayer's original poem, some might not call these verses great poetry. But again, I would have to ask, if Casey at the Bat and other simple poems about, about baseball aren't great poetry, then what is? No, the outcome wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. Man, you could say that again. It was embarrassing to see the way those boys couldn't play. Mighty Casey standing there staring at two meatballs down the middle, and then the pitcher serves him up a tasty-looking fastball delivered on a platter, hot off the griddle. Old Casey wasn't looking so big then. Didn't seem so so keen of sight or, or blessed with might. Time for a name change here. Instead of, of Mighty Casey, maybe from now on we should just call him less than the best, but at least he was white. <laughs> no, no, no. Th this is no time to be bringing up old slights. What's done is done and there's no going back. And so I won't bring up all of the work done over the years for little or nothing by folks that were black. I guess I could never help being confused, though, at the way some folks were, were used, and, and used hard, I might say, worked and worked and, and worked some more, and then never let to play. At least not where the money was, where the, the grass was green and, and always cut. I'm talking about before, Jackie, way back when, when black men couldn't play ball. Say what? <laughs> couldn't play? They could play. And play they did every day, as well as any in the land. With hearts and souls, hitting and pitching and running on lots, littered with stones and sand. But back to Casey, that, that mighty man who left the fans in Mudville that day crying. Time to put that batter down is what I say. Like you might a, an old dog dying. Not because you don't love him still and... and and not because that dog ain't trying, but it, it's long top past time, son, to, to just move on, to put a new end to that story. Let's put a man in that poem who can hit the ball, maybe a, a, a darker shade of glory. Well, all right. We'll go back like so many writers have before to that Mudville patch of dirt. And let's just say because it might have happened this way. Say somehow, uh, Casey, he got hurt. Say just for, for speculation here, for, for grins and giggles, if you will. Say somehow, Casey stubbed his toe in the eighth, and they went to the bench with a, a lineup card to fill. Well, say Acuna had already hit the showers. Probably happened more than once that way. And uh, Jimmy Blake had emptied a case of Rheingold cans and was way too soused to play. The other, the, the other players been sitting there that day waiting for their turn to come. They left the ballpark already thinking the game that day was done. It was just one old black man standing in the clubhouse holding a broom who said, I've been known to swing a bat. And with no one else to send up to the plate, they gave him Casey's shirt and hat and said 
if anyone should ask, and we mean anyone, you just tell them you, 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 you recently lost a bit of weight and, and you've been working a lot in the sun. We're going to call you Casey, if you don't mind. And for today, that's who you'll be. That's fine, he said, because that's my name. I played a little ball in Kansas City once, and since then I've been called KC. KC from Kansas City. He was a monarch, if, if ever there was one. The king of clout, he'd been called. The prince of players, the, the duke of getting it done. You're always talking about your, your KC. That nothing for the Mudville Nine. Let me tell you here the story of this shade of glory who played in another time. I know you've, you've all heard what they tell about cool Papa Bell, who when wearied from knocking him out of the park, could turn off the light and be under his covers, asleep in his bed before his hotel room was dark. Or of uh, Josh Gibson, who with one prodigious swat cleared the stadium wall with a hard hit ball in the house they say Ruth built. The naysayers may cry, that's a lie. Well, no one has ever kept naysayers from naying. But that ball was still going up toward the sky when it was lost to the eye and it never was found, I'm just saying. Now, you're gonna wanna bring up Ty Cobb. And well, you should, cause Cobb was good. But was he really great? How many times would Ty Cobb have stolen second base if there'd been, say, Big Lou Santa in a crouch behind the plate? Old Cobb could, could hit the ball better than most. I'll give you that. And for his time, he was all the rage. But how would Ty Cobb have done if he had to face someone like a, a young Leroy Satchel Page? Old Cobb, and he'd come at you with his back wasn't sliding in hard, cutting you with both spiked feet. It's a cruel way to win. Unlike the stealing home. Clean as a whistle like Jackie done, sliding safe and popping right back up without missing a beat. <laughs> yeah, Jackie stole stole second a, a slew of times, and, and he stole third a whole bunch too. And more than once, that man stole home with his conscience clear. And the pitcher just, just standing there, holding the ball, not knowing what to do. The best that most young ball players today could do could be fairly compared to Jackie's worst. You know, on a third strike dropped one time by a catcher in Brooklyn, I watched that man steal first. Old KC was the, the likes of all that, though older now and, and crowned with gray. And I'm talking more than just a trace. Still, he moved like no one I ever seen. Now there was a cat with grace. You know, he's talking about Casey, Casey this, Casey that. But I swear there was a, there was a change in the air when KC came to the plate wearing Casey's hat. He tapped his spikes. He took a look at the pitcher. And he spit into the dirt. He was holding Casey's bat in his hands and he was wearing Casey's shirt. Casey, do well, murmured his wife, waiting up in the stands. Casey, Casey, roared the crowd. And she was just as dignified and quiet as the throng there that day was loud. Now, now Casey watched. Casey waiting for his pitch, not worried about a thing. He'd done this a thousand times before. He stood with the bearing of a king. He dragged that very first pitch, tossed his way, laid it down like a baby in the soft green grass. And it was already round in first when the pitcher picked up that ball and threw it past the first baseman who watched it roll out onto the right field lawn, where the right fielder grabbed it and threw hard to second. But by then, old KC's long gone. So the second bagman throws hard to third, a new wrinkle on that old tinker to Evers to chance. But with old KC running the ball pass, those players didn't have a chance. Now, KC's round in third and he's racing toward the plate. The catcher's jumping up and down, waving both hands. Where's the ball? Where's the ball? 
Where's the ball? Thrown in desperation over the dugout. It's somewhere up in the stands being fumbled over and fought for. A hundred hands grab it for a souvenir. And the fans are jumping and shouting and laughing and, and men are kissing women and hoisting cups of beer. There's nothing can stop KC now. We're champs, you chumps, is the cry. And there's no one can stop us from winning, except for KC, who slows to a stroll, and the whole world stops spinning. Go home, go home, the crowd urges him on. Let's get this done. The game is over. The game is won. But KC is just standing still now, his toe two inches from the plate. What's going on, the crowd wonders aloud, not knowing why, why KC just stands there with a, a halfway kind of smile. And the question races around the ballpark from man to woman to child. What's going on? Touch the plate, touch the plate. A thousand voices pray. And KC just stills them all with a hand in the air and he says, let's first talk about my pay. <laughs> 